just start off by saying uh, the acknowledgement of country in the spirit of uh, reconciliation, Belmont acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present, extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Okay, so let's just get straight into it. Um, so, Melbourne Island took um, a project which was completed in October 2021. At, um, at the time, it didn't have a name. It was actually just the Granville Stadium. Um, it went through quite a process in terms of uh, actually um, starting or getting on, on the ground because uh, there was an over budget issue with regard to uh, with council. Um, we tended the project a couple of times. Fortunately, um, in the end, a solution was found. Uh, DWP, who was the architect, uh, investigated some overseas options. At the time, we couldn't find uh, an economical um, timber option locally that could produce um, the structure that you see in front of us. Uh, part of the reason is that uh, this structure has, at the time, I think that's been over, overtaken by uh, the Sydney fish market, but it had the largest cantilever, timber cantilever uh, members that um, had ever in the Southern Hemisphere. So it was a, um, one of a kind that was um, fairly new to um, Australia. The other challenge we had was also um, COVID, obviously, which caused us a bit of uh, grief, which I'll go into. So the purpose of the stadium is a sports and community um, centre for um, the Cumberland Shire Council. Um, it was a $10.1 million project overall, uh, plus GST, 53 weeks uh, for its completion. So just some interesting uh, statistics and facts. So there's 135 cubic metres of blue land timber. Um, we used a 100 tonne mobile crane on the site. Fortunately, uh, we had plenty of space within the actual um, project to actually um, sort out the timber, the containers, and also install the timber. Uh, we, we installed 1,500 cubic metres of concrete. So this structure is predominantly, as you can see, timber and concrete. Uh, 2,000 tonnes of reinforcement, 600 square metres of class one precast, and a roof area of about 900 square metres. So, uh, as I said, it was a first of its kind. Initially, um, DWP and Northrop um, came up with a solution for a timber structure. Um, typically, in the past, this would have been done in a steel structure. Obviously the benefits um, obviously outweigh the steel in a number of ways, particularly regarding sustainability. And also um, at this time, these beams that you can see, um, as well as columns, originally they were the um, going to be the actual timber element of the of the building, the glue lamb elements of the building. What um, Belmont are in discussion with Rubna, who we um, spoke to from overseas, and Theka, who was their agent in Australia, came up with an idea of actually um, um, substituting steel purlins and replacing them with timber purlins and also installing these glue lamb, um, or should I say, uh, cross laminated timber panels, which you can see which sit above the actual uh, beams that you see here. As I said, um, Belmont are partnered with Thecker to complete the design and manufacture. So you would have probably seen the first slide I put there that was a construct only contract. In regard to the actual structure itself, it was more uh, developed into a DNC, um, which we controlled as the builder. So at the time, um, that was done in, but with uh, an Italian uh, engineer, as well as Northrop, who were here um, in Australia, ensuring that um, the design compliance actually met um, Australian standards and the building code of Australia. 
So um, this shows a bit of a, um, during construction, in terms of when the actual structure and frame was put together. Now, while I said that uh, steel was predominantly removed, the only thing that we remained, and which was actually also um, sourced from overseas um, with, through Rubna, was uh, these cross bracing, which uh, these tie rods, et cetera. So that was the only real steel, as well as some steel in the in some framing um, still bracing in the walls. Uh, if I get to it, I'll go through a uh, bit of a, um, a flyover which shows you in a couple of minutes uh, the structure actually going together, which is quite interesting. So obviously when you have all of these components coming from overseas, uh, the biggest concern is how to put them together. So to ensure that they did go in like a jigsaw puzzle, a lot of time was spread, spent at the front end to make sure that the actual design, the 3D design was coordinated with um, the structure as well as the survey that was happening on the ground to ensure all the bolts, et cetera, were lining up with columns, which lined up with all the beams. So these were all numbered and obviously we had a number of containers that were delivered. So we had to make sure those containers arrived um, in an orderly fashion. Sorry, oh, too much. So that, that just gives you an example of some modeling that uh, was done. Um, once we picked up with the, the design and uh, run with it, so what were the key installation concerns and what were our mitigation strategies? Well, obviously, um, while things have moved a little bit, and I believe in Australia, we've sort of got options there now, and we're actually looking at a project that we've recently tended for, um, which is for the Warriorwood Community Centre, um, where glue lamb is more readily and probably comparable in price to what we were able to source the material from overseas, our biggest concern was one, how do we contract with an entity overseas that we don't even have um, or we've never dealt with before. Having a bit of an Italian heritage, well, actually 100% Italian heritage, I think I can actually say that um, my biggest fears was what was the fact that how do we trust the Italians to deliver on time? So um, that was one of the big issues for myself, um, knowing a bit about the culture. But to my surprise, my pleasant surprise, that was all dealt with um, and it went very seamless. Um, our supplier, Theca, took on the exchange risk in terms of the dollar, obviously volatility and currency, when you're talking about a, quite a large priced item. There's the issues of time delays and logistics coming from overseas. At the time, we had problems with shipping. Um, and this also lends itself to making sure that um, if you are dealing with an overseas supplier, that you can't just go cheap is best. You need to understand how are they going to get it, the timber to Australia? How, what are their custom processes? who pays for the custom stamp duties and all those sort of things, which may be not included in uh, the, the, the quote that you might get from overseas. All of these things, we just needed to make sure that we were comparing um, one against the other and make sure we had uh, an apples for apples comparison. So there's the quality expectations, both in terms of the nature of the material. So the material that we, brought in from overseas is um, from a regrowth forest and um, is uh, spruce timber. So this sub timber is actually also being used um, and on a prior project on the Marrickville Library for the um, Inner West Council. Um, sections are different sizes and shapes, but in essence uh, comes from this, the source is exactly the same. So that was part of our um, due diligence in terms of reference checks with the supplier to make sure that, you know, we weren't going to be just the guinea pigs and uh, make sure that we were going to um, succeed in what we delivered to, um, 
to, for the project. As I said previously, there's compliance issues and hence why we had Northrop, um, the engineers, structural engineers who obviously had to check um, what was being done by the Italian engineers to ensure that uh, there was a level of compliance there to our Australian standards and um, the building code of Australia. Um, we went through the 3D modelling, design documentation. So obviously take, getting the material from overseas also means that we've got other considerations that potentially not as uh, stringent as what you, what you have over in Australia. And that's ensuring the timely approval and sign off of workshop drawings to allow the time for manufacture and, um, and shipping. I've already jumped ahead and uh, talked about the comparable uh, suppliers. Um, this connection detail here, uh, the reason why it's, uh, this was done in this fashion is obviously for durability. Um, if you go to uh, this, the actual uh, um, stadium today, I think you'd be very surprised to see how well the timber is held up, even with UV, um, with the sun, you know, our, our sun here in uh, the Southern Hemisphere. Um, this, this, the timber still looks the same, so the coating is doing its job. Um, but in order to minimise any risk, we actually um, set uh, the timber up on these base plates, which were raised from the floor so that any water wouldn't be able to pond and uh, sit around where the timber is. Um, obviously, any timber, you know, over a longer, long duration of um, being wet will obviously, um, the tannins as well as obviously the impact to the timber itself is not uh, the, the best thing for it. Um, so, you have about five minutes left, Alf. Thanks. Uh, sorry. I'll, um, okay, sorry. Yeah, so that's the uh, transport. We talked about design. Um, so, what made this project a success, and I believe is a, a recipe for success for any project is uh, the uh, client, the design team, and ourselves coming together to resolve the problems and, um, and resolve the issues so that we came up with the best solution for the project. Um, so this is just showing um, during construction, some of the um, works, during that process. Um, so as I said, you need to consider post-project management, which is also to the uh, longevity and maintain the timber in the, in the state that it uh, is installed. Um, so you've got the uh, what does and what and where, these are often the, the specified finishes and structures and finishes associated with timber. Um, understanding the project loads goes without saying, coming back, coming from an engineering background. As I said, this cantilever here at the time was the uh, biggest cantilever in a timber frame structure that had been built uh, in um, Australia. So we've, I'll, I'll just run you through, I've got a couple of minutes, a fly through, if that's okay, Kyle. Of course. Um, All right, ahead, yes, please. Which I think you know, rather than hear me, you listen. You, you'll be able to see a, a video which is quite interesting, and you can understand what I've been talking about.
Okay, hand it back to you, Kylan. Thanks for um, giving it a solid crack, Alf, and, and I'm sure everyone really appreciated the fly through and your presentation. So th thank you so much for that. And we'll we'll ask you to come back at the end for to answer some Q&A. We had some great questions come through during your presentation. So thank you so much, Alf. Um, and now we'll pass on to to Jane. So thank you, Jane, for joining us. And um, yeah, please feel free to share your screen and um, and we'll jump into your, your presentation. Not a problem. Um, thanks, Kylan. Let me... I'm going to do a similar thing and figure out hopefully this one. Beautiful. There we go. All right, over to you, Jane. Not a problem. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Kylan, and um, really great to, to be here. And uh, I'm going to come at this from kind of a different angle, and hopefully everyone can kind of stay with me. But I'm sure it's a topic that a lot of people in this room are pretty familiar with. Um, and have lost, asked a lot of questions around install before. So um, you heard a bit about my background earlier. Um, so I'm the technical sales engineer at Veridi Group and kind of the way I describe how I work and a lot of people who might know me in this, in this session is that I communicate reasonably complex building solutions in much simpler terms or finding easy pathways to go through the process of putting engineered timber onto your project. So it's not about dumbing down that process. I'm just here to find kind of the path of least resistance. Um, and in particular through Veridi Group, um, now I'm, I'm gonna say these words a lot in this pre presentation, that Veridi are a timber prefabricated manufacturer. So we're based out in Campbelltown, New South Wales. And what that kind of means is that we're a bit different to traditional um, engineered timber suppliers. So we don't actually make our own engineered timber products, but we buy from others around the globe. We um, buy from Rubner, we just heard from Belmadar around Rubner and Thekka. You know, around the globe, as well as in Australia, we then add components to that engineered timber to either make timber perform better, or we deliver it to site as a pre-finished solution. And that's the prefabricated element to it. So we just heard from Belmadar about um, kind of the role of install as a head contractor, and I'm coming from a subcontractor side. So I'm essentially coming from the side where my expertise is in the engineered timber product. And how do we go about installing our product onto um, a project site? So Along those lines, I am not here to show you a bunch of photos of where projects have gone wrong on our work sites or what details work best. I thought I'd kind of challenge you guys around what a supply and install contract means for a supplier like us, or a supplier like Veridi specifically. Um, and in particular, I really need to start teasing out this idea around uh, what is a product and what is a building solution. So, Arguably, you know, engineered timber is a product. You can go out and you can buy a CLT panel, you can buy a glue lamb um, beam, but a timber structural concept or a timber prefabricated structural concept is a building solution. And so the art of that prefabricated side, which in my opinion might mean, not mean anything, but really it's largely prefabrication is only possible with timber structures. Um, and particularly in terms of a building solution, because we have so much adaptability across engineered timber products. So in particular, we're talking about adding components like glazing suites, external cladding, other pre-lined products, you know, all of that becomes your building solution. So Veridi is kind of in this unique little position where we have a really clear overlap between a product and a solution. We, we complete buildings up to lockup, you know, or um, sometimes it's talked about completing the weatherproof structure or the weatherproof box, but we can only do that by using products like engineered timber products. So that's the kind of overlap in the center of our lovely Venn diagram of what is a Veridi solution. So we talk about these, you know, reasonably complex building solutions that are made up of multiple different components like these wall panels, which is, you know, a photo walking around our factory in Campbelltown. Um, and, these are all completed in our factory, largely pre-finished, largely a lot of um, elements go inside them, and then we ship them out to a building site. All of them have a, a timber structural basis. So this is a um, floor cassette image. 
we use our CNC machines to process these timbers. It's very standard practice. Um, you know, the timbers we can buy from all different distributors around the globe. Chosen a lot and are adaptable across those different, you know, where is this element being used, the suitability of the project. For example, this floor cassette uses H3 treated LVL and marine flyboard on top because they are ground floor cassettes. So they're very close to the natural ground level. Now, all of this is well and good in our factory, but what happens when we ship these out on a truck and these components arrive on site? You know, how, how do they actually go together? Which bit goes first? You know, what sits on what? <laughs> you know, do they need to be perfectly level? How do we get that datum perfectly level? What are the what are the base details? What are the edge details? How do we make them watertight? You know, how do we how do we lift these elements without damaging all of the pre-finished parts to the prefabricated side? Let alone how do we lift them? Because we're talking about elements that could be up to sort of one, two, three tons. Um, you know, some of the walls that go out of factory in the last week have been three tons. So Veridi made the decision quite early in the piece that we have to offer supply and install um, contracts. There's no other way of getting our products or our solutions into projects, you know, safely, accurately, um, and getting those benefits that you get out of a timber structural solution without us doing both of those parts of the contract. So we've partnered with installation businesses who are really energetic about learning about our systems. Um, and they can really clearly see the benefits it offers their teams and, and how they can kind of position themselves to be our partners. And in particular, this really starts to unlock those benefits for the program when we have people who are really knowledgeable about our installs. It becomes more risk for a, a company like Veridi, um, but the benefits of getting the, pro, the solutions we have and the pathway to kind of specifying our product becomes really simple. And it's really easily digestible for a help head contractor or for a client or even just, you know, simply for the project team. Um, sometimes this is kind of referred to as like a super subby or a lead subcontractor because we essentially become this kind of one stop shop for supply and install of the main components of that structure or that solution I was talking about earlier. So whilst that kind of sounds super simple and like I've just, you know, solved our problem of specifying products on a project site. You know, it doesn't mean that we have completely detailed installation <laughs> manuals. It doesn't mean that kind of any supplier or any installer can pick up our like IKEA manual of how to put together our building flat pack. Um, you know, it becomes rather difficult actually to put together these types of manuals because I mean, everyone in this room would know that projects are different compared to the last. We learn lessons from the last project and we're actually really passionate about developing our solutions so that they're quite different to every project from the last. And we solve those problems as we go. We don't just kind of write it and expect everybody to just deal with it for you know years to come. We do, however, have pretty extensive design guides, which is on the other side. And design guides, you know, they're based around compliance to the NCC Australian standards. They very clearly outline where our product products work well and where they don't work well. But compared to installation, design can have a really clear set of kind of rules and guidelines around it for a product. But the install side is not necessarily as simple of a manual that you can write. So kind of the first lesson we learned as a supplier um, was 3D shop drawings. It's where incredibly visual industry, everyone loves a good 3D. So everything that goes through our factory in Broody is 3D shop drawn, 3D shop modeled as well. It's signed off by consultants, by clients. It's tracked through a QA camera process in our factory. It becomes basically a live version of like a time-lapse video where everyone can track exactly where we're up to in the manufacturing process. They can track exactly what's going into their finished building solution. And it becomes a really clear way of communicating with our clients as well as our installers. So our installers pick these um, 3D shop drawings and 3D models up because they largely look kind of like this. They've got lots of color, visual graphics. You can really clearly kind of see the components that Viridi will be installing onto the job. 
down to like each of the door jams where all the services provisions have been placed, how our lifting elements go inside, walls, floors, um, everything. And it becomes this really clear communication process to kind of turn this 3D model that we create into a building or a series of buildings in this case. And actually this is a really fun job to talk about. Uh, and I, I do a lot of talking about this job because it's a defense project, but our installers got so efficient, so efficient on this project uh, that we were putting each of these buildings, these two story buildings up in just under three days. Um, so when you think about the quickness of that kind of install, the program benefits that you can get, it, it's a pretty excellent story for our product um, to the point where the roof shader couldn't actually keep up with us. He was taking longer to put the roof shading on than it was for us to build a building. Or another one is our schools projects. So again, it's a 3D model that's got all of the information within it becomes this really clear um, kind of instruction manual almost of how to put together a building. And in reality, it doesn't actually look much different to what the 3D model looks like. And all of these projects are really only possible when we talk about a supply as well as an install. It's what happens when that product leaves the factory and how we can clearly define each of those um, products and how they are actually installed on site. So this, this school job actually, it completely bucketed with rain as we all know, um, kind of the start of, was it last year or this year? I keep running out of what you were in. Um, but of course, everyone in this um, audience would know that moisture is timber's enemy. Um, so we've been lucky enough to really work together as a bit of a partnership between the head contractor on this job. Our installers asked to really identify and assess each of those rain issues on site because uh, we didn't have the roof completely on at that stage when it did bucket down for like three weeks straight. Um, and how it managed that moisture became a big collective group um, it, like decision process around how we can how we can make sure that those issues are managed again um, on the next site. And the lessons learned around this project, I could give a whole other seminar on, but, uh, but look, it, it becomes more of that process where Veridi is truly entrenched in how the product is made and used and installed on, on the project. So hopefully now I've kind of made it a bit clearer around why we choose or why it's important for a supplier like Veridi to offer supply and install. Um, contracts, but I haven't really spoken much about um, the risk side. I mentioned it a little bit earlier that this type of contract means that we take on more risk. And risk is sort of what takes a product into a solution because normally in a prefabricated solution, it'd be about attributing the risk to the party that knows, knows the best about that product and is best placed to manage that risk. So in other words, who on your project would be most knowledgeable about prefabricated timber products or prefabricated building solutions? And I'm going to put my hand up that that is often us. And we're, we're very happy to impart our knowledge and educate everybody on the um, process because we, we want to see more timber in projects. We're, we're you know, in, intensely ingrained in that. Everybody in Veridi, and it's actually a goal of Veridi and our team is to assemble one of the, the most well-known teams of people of experience across our industry. You know, combined, the, uh, the team on the screen here has like over decades worth of mass timber engineering, manufacturing and building experience. You know, myself and Nick Houston have engineered some of the, the first mass timber buildings across Australia. Um, and, you know, that was up to 10 years ago particularly when you talk about Nick's experience. So we're trying to assemble that team that does not necessarily know the best solution, but we're willing to challenge everything that's happened in our experience previously to try not to repeat the same uh, mistakes or the same, um, or learn those lessons, basically. And this just shows a very small selection of you know, projects that we have personally worked on or constructed. You've got this wealth of experience across different sectors, different heights, different clients. Um, but look, the point here is actually to ask someone who's done it before. I suppose that's about as basic as I can get it. You know, we're not, we're really, we're not secretive about being really energetic about putting timber into projects. Um, and, and we don't hold these lessons close to HS. We want to see more um, engineering or in more architectural, more 
construction industry professionals using timber solutions or even better using timber prefabricated solutions and you know we want people to test us i love it when people test me and i'm giving a presentation to um lots of different um clients or groups and you know i want you to give me inspiration around where we might have not have solved a problem before or see more of this industry really challenge the status quo around this disorganized kind of black box what construction sites can be and showing that there occasionally is no clear path to the end of a project and we're really trying to throw that on its head where supply and install contracts like these can kind of revolutionize that idea where you can clearly track where we're at what's going on where where we are going to be delayed across the project where it might be inefficient or a bit more complex let's just try and make it simple basically is probably the goal here <laughs> and i think that's kind of it from me today but yeah, look, I, I guess we've seen the mass timber market grow so rapidly over the last you know, whatever, five to six-ish years. And I think it's kind of at the point where we need to see a bit of a shift from just straight timber as a product. And we need to move into these solutions-based ideas where we can really leverage what timber can bring into our projects. And that doesn't always, doesn't always have to be different prefabricated options, but it just might need to be a bit more adaptability across different engineered timber products and how they can be combined across in supply and install contracts. Um, and look, from Veridi's perspective, I mean, we can only do this by offering supply and install. And I'd love to hear if anybody disagrees with me on that, um, because it's quite a challenge for us to just send our product out and nobody knows what to do with it. So, yeah, I think that's probably it for me. Thanks, Colin. Thank you so much, Jane. It's, it's fascinating to hear about that idea of stewardship and the the blending of of the materials but also the contracts and in, in in getting these things built um so thank you for that presentation we have a whole bunch of really interesting questions coming through so um alf um if you could join us um we'll start with you we'll start with you we'll start with a question for yourself jane um question from Bay Mitty. Um, how is the certification process handled thinking of form 12 or form 16 install inspections in Queensland? How can a certified pass cladded buildings? Yeah, so I always try and describe it where we are your manufacturing partner, we are not your certification partner. So Veridi doesn't have, um, for example, the insurance to um, certify or engineer the buildings. We work very much hand in hand with architects, with engineers. And they will always be across what's going on in our, and that's part of the transparency that I'm, I'm open about. Um, we've had heaps of certifiers run through our factory. Again, we're not secretive about what happens in our factory. You're welcome to come and see it. Um, so often the first couple of you know walls for example um the certifier will be there they'll watch it they'll spend a couple of days with us if they have to um or it'll be a couple of hours whatever they choose they'll see just what happens and then often it's just about that documentation process going back to them and them seeing and tracking from the cameras perspective for example um so in essence it's not that different to what happens on a building site it's just that you do it in our factory mm -hmm. as opposed to the building site. <laughs> Mm, indeed. Um, you both mentioned uh, extensively about the use of 3D design. Um, in one of the major checkpoints that a 3D, 3D design will go through is, is, is checking with the broader team and signing off of models. So um, I'm curious to understand how both of you dealt with the, the issue of certifying and stamping and approving 3D documentation. So perhaps I'll start with you, Alf. Um, how did you um, use the 3D model to, to certify or did you use the 3D model to, to certify? I suppose the better question is, was the model good enough that you didn't have to do 2D drawings? Um, yeah, the model was good enough, had to be good enough. Um, obviously, you know, from our side, we needed to ensure that we provided the original survey um, and set outs based on the, well, the architect DWP had already um, done the modeling in 3D. So um, that gives you a baseline to start with. Um, we had to do the structural drawings, uh, which is not uncommon in any job, um, irrespective of whether it's timber or steel. Then um, I suppose the, 
more challenging thing was to make sure that drawing was those drawings were coordinated with the our in this case our supplier which was overseas in Italy um, and making sure that um, all the measurements dimensions all related to what we were doing um, on site here in Australia so that became uh, I think what Jane was saying you know the 3D model became the working document the tool for everyone in terms of communicating we had very quite a number of meetings um, team meeting like this fortunately I wasn't running the team meeting so it went more smoothly than my presentation but um, anyway we had guys here that uh, could communicate and we basically discussed and uh, looked through all the detailing side of things um, we developed um, and I think our solution came about and the reason why we actually tried to simplify it by introducing more timber members than what was originally contemplated in the original design by DWP. Um, and then we obviously got it certified because um, we needed to get it certified here in Australia. That's where what, what Northrop's job were, um, that's what their responsibility was in the whole process. So before we put uh, the order in place and we got manufacturing going, uh, Northrop had to actually check, check off on the uh, final 3D model. We actually had to provide some design calculations uh, from the engineers from Italy to Northrop to make sure that what they had, the size of members um, they were comfortable with, particularly, as I said, you know, we had this long cantilever span, which again, we did actually have an issue when we uh, had arrived here. Unfortunately, all everything uh, performed the way it was supposed to. Um, the two end um, beams, however, um, we had a fair bit of deflection. Um, so we, as you would have seen in those videos, we actually had the temporary prop um, a lot of the uh, end brace, the columns and prop some of the um, the actual um, the beams. So, you know, we did have an issue with one of those, um, the two ends, the, the two end beams, which meant we had to do a bit of um, cutting and shafting uh, here on site with regard to introduce some more um, splice plates to, um, you know, take that uh, deflection. But, um, you know, that was all resolved with our installer um, that we had here on site, uh, we, we had in Australia, but they, they're the like little bugs that we needed to um, nut out. And as I said, Ruth, um, Northrop basically did the design at the, or design certification at the end of the day, um, just to satisfy uh, the OC requirements. Excellent. So it was clear that the 3D model was was at the centre of all of it. It's great to hear that. It would have been a lot. I can't imagine the workload would have been involved if you had to go through 2D revisions. Um, how do you find that process in the Veridi workflow, Jane? I mean, it's very similar. As you say, the 3D model is the centre of where we start. Um, now, at Veridi, we, it comes down to that risk again. We actually redraw all, so we don't take the Revit models or the coordinated Revit models from consultants. We use that as a guide, but we produce an entirely new model for us. And that's that's purely from a manufacturing perspective um, that everything that comes out of our model goes directly into our manufacturing lines. So everything that's inside that model, we have to own and we are responsible for. We can't take the risk that the consultants have, for example, a level 400 detail model, which often they don't, they'll draw up to level sort of 300, maybe even 200. And we have to take that step further. Um, we also procure off a lot of our 3D models. So we know exactly that there's gonna be 5,302 screws of a certain type. Um, so that gives us a lot of guidance. So we, we place a very heavy importance on the 3D model. Um, but we do also place a lot of importance on 2D shop drawing. So often consultants can get a bit overwhelmed or project teams in general can get overwhelmed with our 2D drawings because we also do a lot of um, logistics. So for example, a, a wall panel, which has eight different stations in our manufacturing lines, you will get eight different drawings, which shows, you know, the lining that goes on one side, the timber core to the middle, which could be a CLT panel, it could be a timber stud wall, the insulation, the flashing, the glazing suites, the um, external lining, the external sarking, the cladding, it's, it's sort of an ongoing process that we have to document each of those stages. 
and that all, all tracks through that QA process I was talking about earlier as well. Um, we also then draw a whole bunch of lifting diagrams so that we can make sure our installers know where to hook into or where the slings need to be attached to lift it correctly into place and not damage those pre-finished linings, um, for example. So it's it, the, the documentation side is incredibly important from our perspective. I've got a question for yourself, Alf, in regards to local versus international supply. So um, the question is, could you please elaborate on the rationale behind selecting an overseas supplier instead of opting for an Australian manufacturer? Yep, um, I think I touched on it uh, during the presentation. Um, so the project, obviously, I think even Jane said, you know, there's been a big um, upswing in terms of the use of timber in recent years. So um, why we use the overseas initially was purely cost driven, okay? Um, and also the members that, um, what, what we were building here uh, with the stadium was very unique to, to what was being done in Australia at the time. Um, I know things have developed a bit more. I know the city fish markets, um, you know, that's another big timber structure that's happening as we speak. Um, but at the time, you know, we were essentially the, um, we, we, we were the forerunners of all this um, timber uh, frame construction and um, we didn't have the ability to, there's no supplies in Australia that would supply that sort of mass, sort of uh, large span timbers. Um, there is one which is in Queensland that um, was too cost prohibitive. So whether that was because the lack of competition here in Australia at the time uh, meant that the price was uh, excessive, which meant that the project, as I said at the start, may not have actually got any traction. Um, whereas in Europe, um, timber uh, structures of this nature have been built for quite a long period of time prior to us really uh, dipping our toes into it. So obviously there's a, a little bit more, um, it, it, it's just something that uh, over there it's more common, um, it's been more common. So that's the reason principally we went there. It wasn't my preferred option, to be honest with you, uh, because of all the risks that I pointed out um, mm. that uh, we face in terms of um, even QA wise, you can't just go in and check on the factory and see if uh, things, you know, how things are being built, look at, um, it's not like going in and to a manufacturing warehouse and, you know, you're, you're doing your QA checks and what have you, but we did get updated reports, updated photos, et cetera, from overseas. And as I said, you know, the end product in the end, we were very pleasantly um, uh, pleased and, um, and same with our client. Excellent. Um, in regards to that, um, how did you, get that assurance from 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 the overseas supplier that 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 they could deliver you mentioned that you place a lot of um a lot of a lot of faith um on on tech's ability to 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 deliver and they evidently did um but what what do they do to to convince you to to show you that that they could well i mean like everything i mean um we were well with we, you know we, we we didn't just go out there we did our little bit of due diligence that we could do while they hadn't really done much in australia in terms of a sports pavilion there had been a couple of other projects one was the uh, Maryville library as i said it was completely different structure more traditional structure but um, the timbers being used were the same um, that uh, project had been completed over a year. I, fortunately, um, we were doing another project, which was the Dorf Fraser Baths, which um, is another timber project, but more in the heritage um, side of things in terms of um, the timbers that we actually, um, how we actually under, undertook the work there wasn't a, um, a system that we're talking about here in terms of uh, prefab and um, modular type building. It was more um, your traditional timber build. So we knew the, I knew the client there through the Inner West uh, Council. Uh, we, they were doing a job for the project had been done by Mervac and um, the builder had completed the project. And I got a few references from uh, the client that we were 
local incidents working with at the time as well and um, gave us um, some comfort there in terms of their um, dealings with Rudner. So, um, and then I also spoke to Rudner um, at length before we awarded the project um, and, you know, got a few other projects that they'd done previously, even overseas. So mm. we did a little bit of our due diligence that way. Yeah, so it was mostly a, an exercise in in looking at their at their CV, at their history, um, as opposed to like visiting their workshop in person or that anything of that nature because of the distance involved. Correct, and while we were in the midst of it too, um, before we even got one stick of timber delivered or the first container, we had the issue to deal with with COVID, so no one was circulating anywhere anyway. Um, Indeed. We were fortunate um, and that sort of, you know, that was another big concern from our side. Fortunately, um, from overseas in Italy, that didn't um, stop things um, um, too much in terms of timing wise for us. Um, um, actually, um, the, the biggest issue we had to deal with was with our, our own issues here in Australia with the ports and uh, the strikes that were happening with um, with the shipping. So, you know, um, and also there's fumigation, for instance, that mm. you need to think about as well. Anything that uh, you deal with, with um, any organic material, doesn't matter how it's sourced um, and being timber, um, you know, you need to get fumigation certificates. So we had already addressed that uh, overseas in Italy, but, um, as uh, customs over the Australian uh, border security, they didn't uh, want to go and trust that. So we needed to fumigate again here. And so it sat on port for a bit. So that the biggest delay was actually in Australia in the end. Right. Yep. All about mitigating those risks. Um, yeah. <laughs> if you need to get that capability of overseas that you can't get here, you're going to run into some, run into some challenges. Um, Last question here for yourself, Jane. Um, someone asks if those floor cassettes that you showed earlier were made on the premises. Our floor, our, our offerings usually that we make everything within our factory. So if that's yeah. the premises we're talking about, it's it's made in the premises of our of our factory, and we ship them to site. As right. So you take in like the the LVR pieces, the plates, top and bottom, and then you assemble those cassettes. Yeah, cool. Yeah, answer correct. that question. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, thank you so much, guys. Um, it, it was a great presentation. I it was great to hear both your perspectives on on the, this fine in store from, from from two different styles of projects and two different ways of, of, of thinking about timber. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Not a problem. Thanks, Kylan. So before I before we go, I'll just run through the end of the webinar. There we go. Okay, so. Um, before we end, I'd like to point out that the Australian Timber Design Awards for 2023 um, have now closed and we're about to begin judging. So look out for that and look out for the um, award ceremony, which will be announced later in the year, which this year is going to be out in Melbourne. So if you're in Melbourne, look out for that. We also have the, um, the Timber Offsite Construction Conference and Exhibition, which is being held on the 11th and 12th of September, which is coming up pretty soon. This is a conference where we will explore global trends, sustainable design, tall timber buildings, emerging, te emerging technologies, timber building design, and biophilic buildings, which is again going to be hosted in Melbourne. And the early bird special for that is about to end. So register before the 14th of August to, to save $100 on your ticket. The next Wood Solutions webinar is going to be on the 5th of September at 11 a.m. It's going to be a case study on the Bendigo GovHub building, which is a building that's received, that's received a lot of attention over the last couple of years um, in anticipation of its completion. Now that it's done, we can talk about it, um, how it went and learn from, learn from how it went. So we'll have representatives from Icon Lines and um, Vic Ash there to talk about that, that case study. So... Thank you so much, everyone, and we'll see you in the next webinar. Cheers.